Um, so yeah, I'm Tom Jelton. I, uh, I now cover religion at NPR, but I've also covered foreign policy and national security, so I'm fascinated uh, by this topic and I've tried to figure it out myself. Uh, the the uh, title of our panel is The Muslim Brotherhood Examining the Sum of Its Parts. And uh, I think what we're gonna try to do in this, uh, in this time is to look at what is the Muslim Brotherhood, how it is changing, and how the US government uh, might respond to it. And we have a, a terrific expert panel uh, of uh, four uh, scholars and thinkers here who have devoted many years uh, to the study of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, beginning on uh, to uh, my far right, Mukhtar Ahwad is a research fellow in the program on extremism at the George Washington University. And I think your program is actually one of the co-sponsors here uh, uh, of, of this conference. Uh, and then Jonathan Shanzer, who you probably know, uh, Senior Vice President here at the uh, Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Formerly, and this is very important for today's discussion, a terrorism finance analyst at the Treasury Department. Uh, Sam Tadros from uh, the Hudson Institute Center for Religious Freedom, uh, where he researches the rise of Islamist movements uh, and its implications uh, for regional politics. And finally, Eric Traeger, who is the uh, Nestor Wagner Fellow at the Washington Institute and the author of a new book, a very important book, Arab Fall, How the Muslim Brotherhood Won and Lost Egypt in 891 Days. And Eric, we're gonna have a chance for you to, uh, we're gonna give you a chance to sort of lay out some of your insights from, from that book. So um, as I say, we're not gonna go, we're not gonna do opening statements, we're not gonna go down the line. I, I'm gonna try to focus this a little bit on, as I say, on that narrative. Um, it's gonna be a challenge for me, I have to say, this morning to try and find some areas of disagreement uh, between uh, our panelists. We have, I think it's fair to say, a consensus here. Uh, I was caught- John's a Philly fan. <laughs> okay, <all right. laughs> that's, that's not good. Well, there we go. We'll try and stay away from that subject then. <laughs> Um, my attention was caught by a op-ed that uh, Mukhtar, you wrote with Sam in the Wall Street Journal, uh, in which you said there are two prevailing views in the Muslim Brotherhood. On one side, the Brotherhood is an international conspiracy, slowly infiltrating America. The other side sees a moderate Islamic group that has embraced democracy and renounced violence. Neither of these views reflect the truth. So I think those two views sort of establish the the kind of par the parameters of this discussion, and I think all four of you would probably agree with that general premise that that where we are at are somewhere between those those two views. So that's what we're going to uh, explore. Um, Eric, I'd like to begin with you with a little bit of a Muslim Brotherhood founded in 1928. Uh, what would you say? is uh, summarize the Muslim Brotherhood very briefly, how it got started, what it stands for. Sure, well, thanks for having me. I wanna thank FDD for putting this together and thanks to all of you for uh, joining this conference on such an important topic that we've frankly been doing a lot of work on. Um, it's really important to understand that the Muslim Brotherhood's goal is to Islamize the world from the grassroots up. It preaches a very politicized interpretation of Islam within its society, hopes to achieve state control in all of the states in which it operates. Muslim Brothers claim to have organizations in roughly 70 states. Uh, and then once it achieves control in multiple states, those states will unify and establish a global Islamic state or a neo caliphate. This is very clear in their literature. It's clear from the writings of Hassan al-Banna. It's clear from uh, the more recent speeches given during the post-revolution period in Egypt by Deputy Supreme Guide Khairat al-Shatr. The, the defining aspect of the Brotherhood, though, is how it intends to achieve this. And just in brief, the Muslim Brotherhood is not a big tent organization. It's not a mainstream <laughs> movement. The Muslim Brotherhood is an insular cult. It's very, very hard to join. Becoming a Muslim Brother entails a five to eight year doctrination process in which every member of the organization is vetted for their commitment to the cause and the organization, and at the end swears an oath to listen and obey orders from leaders, the idea being that a rigid insular society of people who basically think the same way is necessary for achieving this power-seeking vision. And finally, um, these individuals, once they've been vetted for their commitment and all of that, are organized in a hierarchical chain of command in which a central leadership historically based in Cairo, known as the guidance office, directs cells on the ground known as families for executing local activities. Now the reason the Brotherhood has been so effective is not 
due to its size necessarily. In Egypt, it was estimated to be a few hundred thousand out of 90 million people, but really because in Egypt, it was the only seriously organized force on the ground in that post-revolutionary period. Eric, um, we've seen a lot of attention on terminology, particularly in this administration, a reaction against using the word Islamic as an adjective to describe a movement and a preference for the word Islamist. How important is that distinction and what exactly does it mean when you say Islamist and is the Muslim Brotherhood the sort of the epitome of an Islamist approach? Sure, well, I, I think it's very important just for precision uh, you know, we're talking about over a billion Muslims across the world, probably in every country across the world, who therefore are going to practice their faith in many different ways. There's no hierarchy in Sunni Islam. There's no pope or anything like that. And so how to interpret Islam is contentious. It's debated. It's debated within families. It's certainly debated among uh, movements and, and that sort of thing across the world. Islamist means uh, someone who's trying to uh, promote Islam, their interpretation of Islam politically, and I want to put a fine point on a certain aspect of that. An Islamist is someone who wants to implement the Sharia. That's a very key phrase. The question, of course, because again, Sunni Islam is uh, so diverse, which interpretation of Sharia? And every Islamist movement mm -hmm. basically has the same answer, which is my interpretation or our interpretation. And this is exactly why there is no such thing as a mainstream Islamist organization, because the second someone comes along and says, the way we interpret Islam is correct, the way you interpret Islam for politics is incorrect, that is very alienating. And this is frankly part of the reason why the Muslim Brotherhood lost power in Egypt so quickly. It alienated a Muslim supermajority public in the same way that if mm -hmm. we had a leader in the United States who basically called people bad Christians, that person would be turned on very quickly. Okay, Sam, pick up the story from there. Uh, Eric just said that the Muslim Brotherhood lost support in Egypt. Egypt, of course, is where the Muslim Brotherhood began. What happened there? What, what happened from the, say, the 50s on up to 2011, 2013? Oh, that's a long period of time. <laughs> but you only got one minute, yeah. I'm in radio, I, it can be done. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the Brotherhood had a moment of enthusiasm in the 1950s as the um, uh, free officers in the military conducted their coup. The Brotherhood thought it was close to power. Uh, many of the Brotherhood members had been in contact with these free officers, and then it received its shock of they were completely annihilated by Gamal Abdel Nasser. Following an assassination attempt against him, the Brotherhood found itself, after it was that close to power, thrown in jails, persecuted, and in that jail experience, many of the Brotherhood members began to wonder, not only what did we do wrong, but how come society accepted that we were so, that we would be oppressed? Why did society not rise against the dictator as he was oppressing us, despite the fact that it is a Muslim majority society? Mm -hmm. And the clear answer that Saeed Utb developed was because society wasn't entirely Muslim. Society was actually in a state of unbelief. And that explains why jailing us, persecuting us, was so easily done by Gamal Abdel Nasser. Released from prison by President Sadat, they found an already existing growing Islamist uh, movement in university campuses that was completely separate from them. They um, engaged with these young uh, people that were in universities, people like that later on became leaders of the Brotherhood, like Khairat al Shatter, like Adminam Abu Hassam al Haryan, and they absorbed them within the Brotherhood. Allowed to operate under President Mubarak, they um, uh, participated in parliamentary elections, in syndicate elections, but mainly focused on building this grassroots base throughout the country. And of course, um, under Mubarak, they both suffered and enjoyed the fact that they weren't uh, the jihadis, so they had some movement of operation within the country. And of course, then became the greatest um, beneficiaries of the Egyptian revolution re that removed Mubarak from power and allowed them to take over um, Egypt quite easily. How's that for a summary of uh, 50 plus 60 years? <laughs> Very well done. <laughs> I did get you a job. <laughs> but I'd say the, the real um, question for the Brotherhood came after the 
the minute the coup happened and they were removed from power, mm -hmm. and the coup came as a complete shock to them. They had thought that they had appeased the military interests in the past and there wouldn't be a coup against them. Uh, it took them by complete surprise. Um, the regime um, arrested not only the top leadership of the Brotherhood, but really decapitated the movement completely by going through various level, first, second, third, fourth levels of leadership and arresting them or forcing them to, um, to try to escape and, and hide in the country or even hide abroad, which put the Brotherhood really in a moment of crisis, unlike anything it had seen before. Gamal Abdel Nasser in the greatest repression of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1954, they hanged seven people. 1965, Qudba and another two were hanged. This Egyptian regime has killed over a thousand Brotherhood yeah. members in one day in a Cairo street. So the kind of repression that they have faced is something unlike anything they have faced in the past. So Mokhtar, what's the, what has been the consequence of that re repression? Where is the Muslim Brotherhood at today and to what extent you know, is where they're at a response to the kind of repression that Sam talked about? In, in many respects, due to what was just outlined, the, the Muslim Brotherhood of today is in many ways going back to its roots. I actually want to go back and, and discuss something that has to do with the overall, uh, overall Irish narrative that's usually discussed about the Muslim Brotherhood. Sayyid al-Banna <coughs> comes, he's a moderate, and comes Sayyid Qutb, the radical, as Sam describes him. But then from the 1970s onward, the Brotherhood becomes a nonviolent movement. Although this has been true that the Brotherhood did not practice uh, violence uh, since the 1970s, the movement never fully uh, found violence to be objectionable from a religious or an ideological standpoint. Mm -hmm. And really before the coup and the Brotherhood was ousted from power, they were closing in on themselves and a sort of alliance started to spring up with Salafis, the most hard line of Salafis in Egyptian society. After the coup and after Rabat, yes, there was fragmentation and decapitation of the leadership. But slowly, over the course of fall 2013, spring 2014, a new leadership structure was beginning to be put in place. Including in that leadership structure were actually existing senior leaders who had escaped uh, this cycle of repression. And what was starting to happen when Sayyid Qud asked the question of why is it that society was allowing us to uh, be repressed and why is that Ahmad Abdel Nasser not listening to us, that society must be Muslim. They, of course, now understand that the idea of takfir on society as a whole um, is not really the best way to engage. And the kind of conversations that were happening inside the Muslim Brotherhood were about how to regain power, how to, quote, resist the coup. In the Brotherhood at that moment, there was a rising faction. This faction is now effectively the new order of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt that found violence to be legitimate on religious, ideological, and political grounds. They believe that there is a middle ground between nonviolence and total confrontation. They call this special operations. Some bastardize the term nonviolence further and call it creative nonviolence, meaning if you hit state infrastructure, if you uh, target just the cops who you mm -hmm. believe are, uh, have been involved in acts of repression, but if it happens that this cop is in a checkpoint or in a police station, well, he shouldn't have been there, and at the same time, this institution is to blame. And so there has been this rising tolerance and explicit support for violence inside of Egypt due to what happened, but also primarily due to the fact that the organization itself never truly became a pacifist organization. Uh, democracy, yes, was something that was accepted by uh, some in the leadership. However, the acculturation process of the Muslim Brotherhood that Eric was, was talking about, in none of these uh, steps in the five to eight years program is there an introductory course to democracy and Jeffersonian principles of, of, uh, of democracy. <laughs> and, and so it wasn't really that difficult for the organization to revert to really what we see today. And we saw the rise of new violent groups in Egypt, terrorist groups, yes, they pale in comparison uh, when it comes to the kind of punch they pack compared to either Al-Qaeda or ISIS operating in Egypt. However, they've progressed and they've become quite evolved. Right now, one is called Hasm, which means decisiveness. The other one's called Lawa'at Thawra, which means revolution's brigade. Now, there isn't a direct line that one can draw from the open source that can say that the Muslim Brotherhood today or a faction in the Muslim Brotherhood directly and operationally controls these groups, but there are plenty of indications that these groups are connected to the organization and at minimum an offshoot. And the real threat today is 
the possibility of more and more members of the Muslim Brotherhood accepting violence as a legitimate tool. Um, if you have violent organizations in the body of the Muslim Brotherhood, as tiny and small as they are, they do open the possibility for linkages with groups like Al-Qaeda. And the Brotherhood today is not just, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood even, is not just uh, confined to Egypt, but these are uh, conversations and uh, again, a, a slide towards violence is happening in Sudan, Turkey, and Qatar. Um, and, and this is the state that we are at today. Now, Mukhtar, um, without challenging anything that you've said, it is true that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, has traditionally believed in coming to power through the political process as opposed to uh, violence. And you've got political parties associated with the Brotherhood and in Jordan, and they've come to power in Tunisia, a political party in Turkey. Uh, I'm curious, and any of you can weigh in on this, <clears throat> To what extent is Islamism sort of now the dominant manifestation of Islamic uh, life and practice, you know, in in Muslim countries? I mean, how powerful is Islamism as a political force that we're going to have to deal with politically? I think Sam can offer some thoughts, but uh, so Islamism, I, I think one of the problems that uh, U.S. policy decision making and even analysis, frankly, for decades ha has missed uh, and and. Eric alluded to this. Islamists are a uh, important player, but they are not the player. The Middle East does not revolve around Islamism, nor does it revolve around Islamists. Yeah. Now, frankly, to be very blunt, we only care about them because, for the most part, the threat of force. Um, if this particular group of people, if, of course, as any of you all know, and, uh, not, there are no shining democracies in the Middle East today, with the exception of perhaps Tunisia, uh, but any force that challenged autocrats was repressively uh, uh, put in its place, just that there was one group of people who didn't take no for an answer and, and actively fought. And this is the reason why we care about them. So yes, they continue to have an influence and they are an important player, but we shouldn't confuse this to, to assume that they are the mainstream in these societies, that, um, you know, that, the, that they must somehow be part of the solution or that they are part of the solution. If they do agree, to, you know, to the rules of the game, and this, to me, this is why Tunisia has been successful. Islamists ceased to behave like Islamists. Mm. They, they, there, there was a strong civil society in Tunisia. Uh, uh, in Nahda did not achieve any of its major ideological uh, objectives in, 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 in Tunisia. Uh, the constitution of Tunisia is not a Sharia uh, constitution. And for that reason, I think the system worked. Uh, the problem of Islamism in the Middle East today is not so much about Islamist participation in the political process. I think none of us here will disagree against that just because they're citizens of these countries. And so, sure, they have the right to participate, just like a white nationalist in this country has the right to participate. But when you're at a position where it's rule and not participation, and rule especially at a time where they're setting the rules for the game, setting constitutions, setting up new governments. This is why I think the experiment failed in Egypt and there was w why there was this pushback. So we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that they are important, but they're not the mainstream. John, I'm gonna get to you in a minute, but I want uh, either Sam or Eric to, to uh, follow up on yeah, that. Yeah, no, I, I just, I think, you know, following up what Mukhtar said, I think it's, again, really important to distinguish between here Islamic and Islamist mm -hmm. for the following reason. Look. The Middle East, you know, the Arab world is obviously supermajority Muslim. Islamic culture, Islamic practice, Islamic values are obviously going to play a role in the political culture and in, in the politics, and that's natural. That's not what Islamism is. Islamism is about implementing the Sharia, but Sharia is just a broad set of yeah. legal principles. Again, the question <coughs> becomes whose interpretation of the Sharia, and every Islamist group comes up with the same answer, ours. And since there is no uh, legitimate, or I should say consensual interpretation of the Sharia, because Sunni Islam is diverse, any Islamist group that comes to power and says, our way or the highway will be destabilizing in one way or another because they're gonna alienate the public. And this is really especially what we saw in Egypt during that very tumultuous post-2011 period. Yeah. yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I agree fully, of course, that Islamism is not Islam. Um, it's always frightening to me how both ends of the political spectrum um, agree on, on only okay. one thing, basically, that. Islamist and Islam are basically the same thing. So whether those that, that want to blame Islam for everything 
or those that, um, that have argued in the previous administration, obviously, that we should accept Islamists as the authentic representatives of this Muslim nation around the world, um, they don't make that distinction, although that distinction is very important. Islamism is a completely modern phenomena. It is completely divorced from Islamic jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. It's actually an argument against to supersede the divisions of the schools of jurisprudence throughout the centuries. It's an argument built on the crisis of modernity, of confronting this Western advancement and providing an answer that we need to go back to this imagined golden age of Islam and through that we can rebuild the Muslim nation once again. That's not something that anyone in the centuries preceding that would have made that argument. These are modern concepts related to modern ideas that came after the Europeans began reaching the shores of the Middle East. The important thing here, of course, to note is that Yes, there was a military coup in Egypt, and there's no denial that um, the tanks and the officers removed the Muslim Brotherhood from power. But there was also a popular discontent, popular demonstrations in the streets that were the largest demonstrations in Egypt's history. And these were not Egyptian Christians, as the Muslim Brotherhood likes to mm. claim in its propaganda. These were not foreign agents. These were regular Egyptian Muslims. It was not in Cairo only. It was in the Delta, places where there are hardly any huge percentage of Christians, where people are more traditional society, conservative. And these people, the regular Egyptian Muslims, did not accept the Muslim Brotherhood as representative of their religion or of their country. That tells us all we need to know about whether Islamism is mainstream or not. Right. So Jonathan, what we've heard from your three co-panelists here is, is really a lot about the diversity uh, of, the, of the political landscape. And what are the implications of that diversity for US policy? Well, this is something that uh, some of us here have been thinking about for, for certainly the last several months as we have heard about the new administration's approach to the Muslim Brotherhood, this idea of a possible foreign terrorist organization designation from mm -hmm. the State Department, which is sort of designating the mothership, if you will, the entire Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood movement. Um, Worldwide. And, mm -hmm. What's that? Worldwide. Worldwide. E you know, e every, every, uh, every of the 70 countries and anyone who's involved with any organization. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, my sense is that this is not only going to be a politically charged issue, and we've already heard that it, it has become that, um, but it's also not likely to meet the sort of legal criteria that the State Department would use. And I don't think from a political perspective the State Department would ever accede to this in the first place. And so that sort of got me thinking about um, what other avenues are available. And um, it sort of brought me back to the, my bread and butter working at, at the Treasury Department uh, a decade ago, and that is why not try to look at each of these uh, organizations individually? So look at each of the, of the factions of the Muslim Brotherhood and determine whether they meet criteria just basically on intelligence, on their merit. And so, you know, I think, you know, just for example, Nahda in, uh, in Tunisia, it's a political movement, it's nonviolent, it wouldn't meet that criteria, uh, and I don't even think there's a reason to look at it. Uh, the Islamic Action Front in Jordan, you know, long-standing um, sort of uh, political opposition, but loyal opposition, and unlikely that the Jordanians would be interested in pursuing that, although we have been hearing about certain support that they've given to Hamas and other groups over the years, maybe not enough. But then there are other groups. You heard about Hassam and Liwa Tharwa in, uh, in, in Egypt. These are violent groups, splinter factions, I think formed in many ways the way Hamas was in 1987, 1988. They broke away from the Muslim Brotherhood um, sort of body politic and created a new violent organization. I think those two would very much meet criteria. I think the Islah Party in Yemen, for example, we've heard for years about the ties that they have to Al Qaeda um, in, a, you know, in, a, in a very permissive environment. Maybe the, the offshoot in Libya might meet criteria. But I think what we want to do is we want to make this an intelligence question, take the politics out of it to the extent that we can. And, and really let this be a bureaucratic issue in, in much the same way that we've dealt with other terrorist problems in the past. Take the politics out, let the intelligence do the talking. So the designation of Hamas was I an example of what you're advocating because that took that organization separately and it was designated as an FTO. 
And that's exactly what you're talking about. Right, but I think though that uh, if FTO is not where we go, there is also the Treasury um, sort of function, which is it's Executive Order 13224, and we have this long list of terrorist entities. And once those original groups, let's just say they're four or five splinter factions that we deem to be low-hanging fruit, well, then you can go after their leadership, their financiers, and you can begin to build out a body of, of literature about this movement, who's violent, who's not. And I think the, the important thing here is that it puts the Brotherhood on notice that the fact that they never fully renounced violence, it lets them know they have a choice and that we're watching. And this is something, I mean, I, I think there's great opportunity right now that we really haven't seen an administration approach it in this way. And now that we know that there is interest, I think it's just a question of making sure that the next steps are pragmatic ones. So the legislation that is that has been introduced in past sessions and that is pending now to designate the Muslim Brotherhood as the FTO, you, you would prefer that this not even come through legislation, that it would be done by the administration ex through executive action? Look, my, my fear is that you have this call for an FTO and then they do the research and find out that it doesn't meet uh, legal criteria and then you have the Brotherhood come out and say, see, we're not, we're not violent, see, right. we're not terrorists. And again, what it doesn't look at is the, the, you know, how to slice and dice this, looking at each of the individual factions and calling them out where, where it's necessary. So I don't think it's a problem, for example, if, the, uh, if Congress comes out with legislation calling for a treasury review of the various factions. It's the FTO in, in particular that I'm concerned about because I fear it might let the, the Brotherhood as a whole off the hook yeah. when it's not deserving of that. Now you've been in the Treasury Department and you've been reading intelligence assessments. I asked you this before. How confident are you that our intelligence community is able to produce a finely tuned, uh, an analysis that's finely tuned enough to, to make the distinctions that you're talking about and to apply the criteria that you're talking about? Well, my, my experience in, in sitting in a windowless room at the Treasury Department poring over uh, documents until my, you know, my eyes went blurry is that um, it's a process, not an event. So it's not as if you say, okay, well, give me everything that you have and then let's just call it a day. What you do is you, you put in for collection requirements, as they're called, and then the intelligence community needs to continue to provide that to analysts until they, they make an assessment of whether there is enough to take it to the lawyers. Uh, it's where I got most of my gray hair, was deal dealing with those lawyers. Uh, but, you know, uh, and, and that's an issue in and of itself, but there's a certain moment where you, re you realize you've reached critical mass, that there's enough information on this one brotherhood branch that we can move forward. And again, I think you get at least four or five low-hanging fruit right off the bat uh -huh. with more targets teed up as a result of the work that you've done. Yeah. Okay, uh, one other question I'd like all four of you to have a chance to uh, weigh in on before we move it to the audience Q&A. Uh, and that is bring it back to the United States. Um, one of the big concerns, we now have, you know, a huge Muslim American uh, <clears throat> community in the United States with uh, mainstream uh, Muslim American organizations, the uh, Muslim American Society, Muslim Students Association, the Islamic Society of North America. Many of these organizations were founded by Muslim, brothers, Muslim Brotherhood members back in the 70s and 80s and so forth. And I know there's a lot of concern that moving aggressively against the Muslim Brotherhood internationally will impact the lives and organizations of Muslim Americans in this country. Uh, how realistic is that fear? How, you know, I don't know if any of you have any thoughts about some of these mainstream Muslim American organizations in this country that do have historic ties to the Brotherhood. Is there reason to, to, for them to be concerned about moving aggressively in this direction? Any of you have any thoughts on that? Sam? Sure. Uh, <coughs> there is no doubt that the Muslim Brotherhood um, had activities in the United States. We know for a fact that the former president of Egypt, Mohammed Morsi, joined the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, not in um, his local village in Egypt, but in Southern California, That's where amazing. he was studying. And he was recruited there by a Palestinian, later on a key member of Hamas, Musa Abu Marzou, in the local Brotherhood cell there in the University of Southern California in the um, early 80s? Mm -hmm. Or late 70s. Yeah. Early. 
And that tells us that there are activities that, um, that the Brotherhood has had in this country. We know also that the Brotherhood is um, a large organization, true, but a pretty ineffective one. There is zero ineffective. 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 Yeah. There, they, as Eric loves to say, they couldn't run Egypt for a year. There is no grand brotherhood. Not that running spirit. Egypt is so easy, by the way. <laughs> I don't want to like, like a new insult would be like, well, he couldn't even control Egypt. You know. <laughs> I mean, so. this is an organization that, yeah, couldn't run Egypt for a year, couldn't uh, maintain support for a year. There is zero chance that this organization. Um, is a threat internally in the United States to implement Sharia, to take over America. Any of these things are just um, conspiracy theories out there. Right. They, they underestimate America and overestimate the Brotherhood dramatically. Right. What I would say is that Brotherhood activities in America started um, with these students coming, none of them wanting or expecting that they would permanently stay in the United States. So these organizations were targeted to organizing Arab students or Muslim students in the United States with the aim of going back home, impacting change or enacting change back home. A shift happens later on as um, larger Muslim communities settle in the United States and organizations that had originally been tied to the Muslim Brotherhood move to become more uh, interested um, focusing their work on the, the stories of um, Muslims in the United States. So while there are these early links, I would say the, the main focus and work of Muslim American organizations today has moved away from the original Brotherhood agenda. We're gonna have more of a chance to, uh, to follow up on this question. We're gonna go to Q&A in a second, but Jonathan, just in terms of specifically what you talked about, in terms of the much more targeted designation approach, uh, would, would, can you conceive of a circumstance where any of these organizations in the, in the United States might be affected by that? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I mean, it, I think there have been actually um, more recent examples of where we've seen brotherhood activity. The Holy Land Foundation, uh, for example, right. which was shut down in 2001, uh, showed that there was extensive ties to the brotherhood and its uh, various arms in the United States. They were actually never indicted, which has been, I think, um, a subject of a lot of discussion here in this country over time. But they're not innocent of being involved in, in, in financing terrorist activities. I think the, 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 you know, looking at this designation strategy that we've been discussing, I think the, the, the point here is that as soon as you have a benchmark for organizations that are banned, right, that, that you cannot finance, well, what it does is it allows us to take a look at whether there are groups here in the US that are involved. And it, it has the secondary effect of just blocking that and, and shutting the door on it. If they continue to do it, then they're susceptible to designations themselves. So it's how you follow up on that and you work with the community after those designations that I think is really where the rubber hits the road. Good, all right, <clears throat> we're gonna go to the audience now. Uh, got some instructions here. Uh, um, you need to stand, wait for a mic, and introduce yourselves. So, um, this is the first hand I see is back over here. Can we give that gentleman a mic? Here it comes. Thank you. My name is Bassam Barbandi. I'm from Syria. We You're a student, Syria, we, did you say? My name is Bassam, and I'm from Syria. Okay. In Syria, we really suffered from Muslim Brotherhood during the revolution. Literally, they destroyed the revolution from day one. They tried to take over the peaceful democratic revolution and call it for civil society to make it more Muslim society. My question will be something a little bit different of that. If I wanna take the big picture, ISIS Abu Nusra, they say always as a way for recruitment that the Christian, the Western, they want to destroy the Sunni world, the Muslim world. Designation, the Muslim Brotherhood, how this will affect positively or negatively on fighting Muslim. Thank you. Eric, you've written about Syria some. Yeah. I haven't, but I can. I, can <laughs> 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 I, uh, I no, I've actually spent, uh, I did a research project on the, uh, on the Syrian uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, so That's what I was talking about. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the question. Um, look, I mean, I think, I think what we're trying to do here is 
content, mar uh, content marginalize that, uh, that, that uh, uh, question. Um, so, you know, we are seeing the Muslim Brotherhood as one set of the problem. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is certainly a, uh, an input into the broader concern about the ideological roots of radical extremism and Islamist extremism. Um, what we're trying to do with this is focus on those aspects of the Brotherhood that are specifically violent. Uh, I, I don't think we see, and maybe, maybe John can jump in here, I don't think we see this as in any way apart from the efforts that are ongoing against ISIS and Nusra, but it's trying to incorporate the Brotherhood into that conversation, not because the Brotherhood is pulling off the kinds of atrocities that ISIS commits, no one on this stage would claim that, but because the rhetoric, the ideology, uh, the, the way they speak about Christians, the way they speak about minorities, their totalitarianism uh, is all part of that, that mix of bad ideas that feeds into extremism. Tom, yeah, go ahead. If I may just real quickly, because uh, the question that Sam said uh, reminded me of something. I think the Syrian MB, we, we didn't mention it in the beginning, uh, definitely is not something that we can look at uh, to designate as a terrorist organization, especially when it pales in comparison to what's going on in, inside Syria with Nusra and, and Daesh. But I think, I think it's one of the organizations that need to be monitored very closely. Mm -hmm. um, yes, this is an organization that has been involved in the political bodies. It has good relationships with some of our Gulf allies. Um, however, some of the people inside the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood do, in fact, uh, finance and support militant groups. They're not jihadists. Um, do, in fact, hold very regressive uh, views. And I should say, actually, the Syrian MB, uh, the, the, the foot soldiers, if you will, the, the actual leaders that we don't see on TV, uh, many of those people uh, were never truly even uh, moderated to a level even of the Egyptian MB. Uh, one final thing I'll say, I remember interviewing Farouk Taifur, who was the deputy uh, leader of the Syrian MB in 2014. He was trying to sell me on how Jabhat Nusra and Ahmad al-Sham are going to eventually uh, become uh, part of the future Syria and that they are going to accept elections. And when I pressed him on this, I was naive. I said, well, how can this ever work? And he said, well, you don't understand Nusra the way that we do. Uh, in fact, there are 200 Muslim brothers that are fighting inside Nusra. And this was an on-the-record interview. So I think there are definitely things in the Syrian MB, I, I, can, I can understand how someone working in the US government is gonna look at Syrian MB and not wanna dedicate the time. But I think the resources should be there to tack on the Syrian MB for something that should be seriously investigated. And in fact, I think some of you have written that uh, MB members in Egypt have been recruited to fight on, yeah. on behalf of ISIS. So oh, they're on both uh, sides. Nusra. Yeah, okay. And if I may, um, the, there has been an argument in Washington, if you allow these people to uh, participate in elections, they are going to moderate. That has not been the reality. The reality has been that they have taken pragmatic steps when they were pressured. It's only when the Tunisian Nahda saw what happened in Egypt and realized the pressure happening inside Tunisia that they were forced to reach an agreement with the secular uh, parties in the country. If we put pressure on the Muslim Brotherhood, I don't think the result will be a radicalization of people, people arguing that um, the Christian crusader world is against Islam. <coughs> it will put pressure on them to take not moderate steps, but pragmatic steps in order to avoid that designation. And would you say that the Muslim Brotherhood, the um, government in Tunisia, ha uh, feels good now about those steps that it has taken? Does it, does it feel resentful? I mean, that's a... I mean, I've, I've, talking with, uh, I've talked to um, um, Nahda leaders, and they've, um, they make an argument that we gave up power, but we, at least we saved Tunisia from the fate of Egypt. And right. I think that's a noble sentiment, and one that they are constantly forced to defend mm -hmm. with other Islamists who view them as traitors, as giving up on Sharia. And of course, on the there's been terrorist attacks in Tunisia oh, since they've been in power. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Here comes a mic. Mohamed <clears throat> uh, Fahmy, uh, former Al Jazeera bureau chief for three months, spent uh, 438 days in 
incarcerated in Egypt with members of the Brotherhood and other uh, prisoners. I think this, uh, before I ask the question, I'm just saying today's event is uh, an incredible milestone and uh, the researchers here are, have done incredible work um, that is very important for journalists like myself. Um, I personally want to- Can we also know. recognize Mohammed? <laughs> um, I'd like to know, now that you have, we have designations of uh, known terrorists who are currently tweeting as we speak, um, and FDD, specifically Mr. David Weinberg, has pointed the names of these people, they've been designated as terrorists by the UN, by the European Union, by the states, um, but they're running free in Qatar today. They're posting photos of themselves in sports cars, and there's designations that say they have been responsible for close to a decade to financing Al-Qaeda, ISI when it was in Iraq, and today al-Nusra and many other groups. What comes after the designation to get these guys? I mean, it's, it seems like it's almost ineffective that they're being designated. And mm. if there isn't any uh, uh, further, more aggressive action, then it's almost uh, just like a, a, an announcement that uh, I think and hope to find some answers from you on how to take it further. Is it maybe even a feather in their cap? <coughs> Jonathan, you want to come Sure. Uh, well, you'll be hearing from David Weinberg, uh, who Mohammed mentioned uh, in, on the next panel, which will deal specifically with Qatar and, and, and some of those issues. Uh, but, you know, part of the problem is when we talk about designation, specifically of individuals, but also sometimes groups as well, um, that what we do is we effectively block them from the American system. We block them from using the American dollar. We make it difficult for them to engage in diplomacy or, or you know, uh, uh, otherwise engage with the United States. But the problem is the system is only as good as those who enforce it. And this is really the problem with Qatar. And, and I mean, not Qatar, I mean, there are plenty of, as you heard uh, Dr. Gates mention earlier, there are many countries in the Middle East that are engaging in double dealing, but I think the Qataris are, are really exceptional at it. Um, they, they take it to an art form. Um, and, uh, and, and this is ultimately the problem. There, is, there are no ramifications for Qatar to do this, especially if we're not willing to apply some pressure. So in other words, it looks right now as if the US continues to go to Doha and say, please do more on this. I understand there's been a few people that have actually, where they've taken action, but many are still roaming free. And so the gap is in the international system. Uh, we don't really have a universal system for imposing designations. It's all about how we pressure countries and how they respond to that pressure. Qatar has been a big problem. Um, I should point out that we did have some questions submitted <clears throat> by audience members in advance. Uh, and as long as you mentioned Qatar, I'll just throw out this question right now, <clears throat> submitted by somebody in advance. <clears throat> Excuse me. How do the disagreements within the, uh, the GCC on the topic of the Muslim Brotherhood contribute to insecurity in the region? Uh, how much disagreement, any of you have the answer to this, how much disagreement is there among the Gulf countries on how to deal with the Muslim Brotherhood? I mean, it's a pretty substantial disagreement, uh, especially between the UAE and Qatar. Uh, the UAE is firmly of the view that, um, you know, the, first of all, the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization under uh, Emirati law, uh, and that including the Muslim Brotherhood in a political process is a recipe for instability. And Qatar has exactly the opposite viewpoint, which is that the only way to have stability is to include Islamists in the process because they reflect something within their societies. My, my own view, frankly, is that that's a really important debate. Uh, it's not a debate that the United States has a great capacity to engage in because that debate really reflects each country's respective uh, internal politics. What we can do is talk about the implications of the Muslim Brotherhood for American national security and for American national security interests in the region. And certainly, were the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, very hypothetically now, to return to power in a place like Egypt, that would have huge ramifications. But the question of whether or not they would be uh, allowed to participate or something like that is something that countries are ultimately going to decide for themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the green tie there. Is that a green tie or a blue tie? I think. <laughs> yeah, she's coming.
good morning. My name is Radwan Masmoudi. I'm president of the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy based here in Washington and in Tunis, Tunisia. My, my, um, my fear is that uh, designating Muslim Brotherhood anywhere, even in Yemen or, or elsewhere, as a terrorist organization will uh, alienate you know, millions of people and drive them to a more extremism. Uh, as we know, in all the elections that have happened, uh, even before the Arab Spring, the Muslim Brotherhood or other Islamic Islamist parties uh, never received less than 25% or 30% of the vote. Um, I grant you, and I agree with you, that they mismanaged the year or two in which they were in power in Egypt. They lost a lot of popularity and, uh, and sympathy from, from the Egyptian people. But would it not be more uh, intelligent to allow them to continue to run for elections and lose in elections after they alienate the Egyptian people because, or the Yemeni or whatever people because they mismanage the government? Would that not be the more intelligent and more democratic way uh, and force them to, 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 uh, to, uh, to become more moderate and more pragmatic that way because they have to attract more voters rather than drive them underground and drive them more secret and more violent, which I think will be a disaster for the whole region. Thank you. Before anybody answers the question, I have a question for you, sir, if you could stand up again. Sure. So is it, is it your sense that they would lose in elections? You mentioned uh, yes. Egypt, but in Egypt they definitely would have lost if we had an election in 2013. You know, and the elections were scheduled, I think, three or four months after the coup happened. I think if the Egyptian people, and especially the Egyptian military, I'm I'm for pol uh, peaceful demonstrations. So the demonstrations that happened against the Muslim Brotherhood in 2013 were very legitimate. It's the coup that I think ruined Egypt's chances to move forward to democracy. I'm convinced they would have lost. They would have gotten maybe 20 or 30 percent. They would definitely would not have gotten a majority if there were elections in 2013. Okay. Uh, Look, either of you, Mukhtar and Sam. Well, I didn't conduct the coup, so uh, <laughs> so it's not up to me to decide, and and it's also not up to the United States. Mm. The fact is that the Egyptian uh, military and a large segment of the Egyptian population saw the struggle with the Muslim Brotherhood as not one that could be solved by democracy. They were fearful for the very essence of what Egypt was. They were fearful um, for various reasons that the Brotherhood was changing the country completely in a means that could not be reversed or that once they lose elections in the future. Um, I think the reality is today, but, but before I go into, into them losing power, I think that the premise of the question I find very problematic. The idea that millions of people are just waiting for this designation and that would drive them into violence, I think is an insult to these members of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, they're not waiting for that designation. Either there are these reasons for violence that drive people to become killing machines, or there are not. Um, I'm an Egyptian Copt. My people have been persecuted for 2,000 years. I don't know of a single Coptic terrorist. <coughs> Interesting, I would say. Yeah. John. So the idea, but, but let me, the idea that simply um, if we, we need to be careful around them, if, if we just say one wrong word, these guys are going to go nuts and go mm. shoot people in the street, I think is really, really problematic and frankly insulting to these millions of people. Look, I, first of all, I fully agree. Um, and and, and you know, I, I think this idea that we need to tiptoe around the problem, I think has been a part of the, the um, um, the sort of gridlock that we're experiencing mm -hmm. in Washington, this I that the idea that it's binary, that either we can or we can't, that it, uh, either the Muslim Brotherhood is, is terrible altogether or, or that it's a force for democracy, and we know who's been sort of pushing these narratives uh, around town. But I, I think the point here is that if you have a group that is deserving of a terrorist organization designation, there's no reason why you shouldn't do it, and I don't understand how a designation of the Islah Party in Yemen or Hassam in Egypt is gonna impact millions and millions of people all around the region. What you're doing is you're being targeted. And this is, we're trying to be as specific as possible so as to not make this a, a, you know, a political issue. 
And, and look, the idea that somehow you could have a terrorist organization or a group that supports terrorism uh, ultimately be part of the political process, which is the alternative here if you don't designate, but we've seen how that looks, right? I look at Hamas and Gaza right now. They're not doing a terrific job of governance and, and there is a crisis uh, that has resulted from the rise of Hamas. So these are the sort of things, sorts of things that we wanna try to avoid and I think that this sort of designation, targeted designation approach can help us get to the right place. Back in February, the New York Times uh, ran an editorial titled, All of Islam Isn't the Enemy. Uh, was arguing against this uh, designation and the line was, such an order now under consideration would be seen by many Muslims as another attempt to vilify adherents of Islam. And Mukhtar, you actually, you actually reacted against that editorial, didn't you? Uh, yes, and, and I, would, I should say again, the article I wrote was, was uh, Samuel Dudros goes straight to the issue of why we need to be specific. Uh, but yes, so I wanted to say other things, but uh, the overall trope uh, that was quite um, out there over the last six months, that somehow this is, you know, Sam said about the insult to, to Muslim brothers. This isn't, what you just said is an, in, is an insult to me as a Muslim, to I think millions of Muslims, this, this idea First of all, that the Muslim Brotherhood is, you know, the, the symbol of, of Islam or is representative of Islam, and that by designating them, then this, you, you will garner this reaction. That, first of all, is an incredible logical fallacy and insulting. But the second insulting thing is the idea that even if that is the case, that by simply designate them, you're gonna, you know, turn Muslims uh, against you. And this doesn't just end with this issue of designation, it's also with other issues about, you know, public messaging, uh, things along those lines. Yes, we should be careful in what we say, but the idea that somehow, uh, because, so for instance, this was evident during the discussions around the uh, travel ban. There are many reasons to be against the travel ban that are well grounded in, in uh, constitutional arguments and liberal arguments and things along those lines. But the argument that because of that, then they will basically kill us with the people that argue this, that will boil down to that. Let's not do this, otherwise it will turn against us. That's what they're saying is incredibly insulting. And I think people who write this, uh, frankly, need to, to, to think before, before they write. Um, but uh, just really quickly, there weren't elections scheduled in Egypt three or four months after the coup. There was a call for early elections. Um, but the, the final thing I'll say, I, I think it's it, what was fascinating to me about this whole discussion of designation is how easy it is, uh, or it was, for people to discuss, well, yes, but let's not designate because of this. And this issue that already we are assuming that the FTO list is a, politi is a politicized list, that groups that we have some sort of political goal uh, in not designating them, let's not put them there. Um, and I think the, the absurdity reached its zenith uh, in you know, 2012, 2013, when it was discussions over Jabhat al-Nusra, and you had people who were seriously arguing against the designation of Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria because this will make Jabhat al-Nusra popular. You know what, this probably did make Jabhat al-Nusra more popular, but it's a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. you know, so that, that's the thing, the FTO list needs to actually be completely de depoliticized. Um, we cannot make political calculations. Either, either they are terrorists or they're not, uh, which is why it needs to be backed up by intelligence. But this issue of political considerations, even if it's a sound argument, it cannot be made when we're discussing designating terrorists. Okay. I should point out, Sarah, that don't, don't jump to the conclusion that we feel insulted by your question. Just for a <laughs> legitimate question. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, you, sir. I apologize to people in the back that I can't see so well. I guess I'm giving priority to these Thank ones. Thank you. <laughs> Mark Allister from the Future Foundation. Future um, Foundation? Yes, based in Washington, but I'm personally based in Baghdad, Iraq. Uh, the question is specifically to Jonathan Shanzer, I believe, about the FTO. Have you been able to establish a relationship, specifically a financial relationship, between the uh, party, the, the Islamic party of the Prime Minister of Iraq, Al Dawa party, and the political or Islamic political party of the chairman of the, uh, they call it the, uh, the chairman of the representative board or the parliament, Salim al Jaburi, which is the Islamic party, the, the financial relationship between them and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt which is well known in, in Iraq, but I'm not sure if it, if it reached uh, Washington. No, I, it, it, it's, uh, it's not, it's, this is not something that we've delved into yet. This is, I think, part of the process, I think, of uh, now that we have an idea of how one can go about this process, we wanna do the open source research that might mirror 
uh, what happens perhaps at Treasury or elsewhere. So uh, this is sort of, I think, part of next steps here is to take a look at where those financial, it just, it's follow the money. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what we'll hopefully do in the months to come. Uh, we have just uh, a couple of minutes uh, left. Um, I don't know if any of you have any closing thoughts, a point that you really came today determined to make and haven't had the opportunity to make. <laughs> The, the, the very quick thought, just to reiterate, you know, and again, this is what Sam and I wrote. Um, this should not be a partisan issue. This shouldn't be a binary between the Muslim Brotherhood. I think something absurd was written that for 30 years, Muslim Brotherhood has been a force for stability and democracy in the Middle East. Um, no, and neither, neither is it Hydra. Um, it's going to come and control America, control the world. Um, this is a regressive uh, organization. Those who do engage in terrorism should be designated. Those who aren't, they should be understood as for what they are, and let's not make arguments that, that just don't reflect reality. But also legal tolerance doesn't have to mean civic tolerance, uh, not because an organization is legal. And, and we as Americans should be best equipped to understand this uh, than anyone else in the world. Uh, we tolerate hate speech. Uh, we tolerate actually many uh, hate groups. Um, that doesn't mean then that we're going to look at you know somebody like you know the alt right and say because they're nonviolent, well, let's engage them because at least you know what they're not killing people, mm -hmm. and if we engage <laughs> them, then maybe you know we will be able to participate, get them to participate in the political process, and and you know, the violent racist, well, the violent white David supremacist. Duke ran for Senate. He's and not a moderate white exactly. supremacist. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so so that's my parting thought. Uh, that, that I, I really think, uh, and it may sound naive, but, but I really think it's about time that the absurd kind of arguments stop, and for this not to be a politicized discussion, uh, but rather one that's, that's entirely based mm -hmm. on facts and what's evident. I know you feel that way strongly, John. I do, I do, uh, and uh, nothing further on that front. The only other thing that I would just note here is, we, and we didn't really talk about the state sponsors of some of these groups. Uh -huh. um, you know, I talked about how you know next generation designations might happen as the result of that first round, and I talked about individuals or charities or, or what have you that we might be able to point to. One of the other things that we should certainly also look at is whether there are state sponsors of the groups that we ultimately designate. And we, of course, have been talking about Qatar here. Uh, we heard Chairman Royce talk about Turkey. These are, of two, these are, of course, the two most prominent funders of the Muslim Brotherhood worldwide. They give a platform to the Brotherhood. And so I, don't, I think that that can't be ignored when we look at this equation. I would say one of the main problems blinding many in Washington is the fact that we tend to view the Brotherhood as an unchanging organization. There's this one thing created in 1928, it's the same across borders, it's the same unchanged by time. Yeah. The Brotherhood went in e the Egyptian case from prison to the presidential palace to the prison once again. If that's not an experience that would change any organization, that would lead to internal developments, I don't know what is. So the reality has been that the, what has happened in the past couple of years in Egypt across the region has had a major impact on the way these various groups have developed. The Tunisian branch, Nahda, has developed in, an, in, a, in a way that we welcome completely, has become a democratic party that participates in the democratic process, but most importantly accepts the basic premises guiding that process, the liberal values of protection of individual rights, of religious freedom, of all of that. The Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood has moved in an entirely different direction mm -hmm. where groups have, have indeed conducted violent operations. Be succinct, Eric. Yeah, just, just the tendency to see the fate of the Muslim Brotherhood as somehow relevant to the fate of Muslims writ large badly dismisses the diversity of Islam, an insular totalitarian cult with maybe a few hundred thousand people does not speak, does not represent, and is not the authentic manifestation of over a billion people. And here in Washington, I think we need to have a greater appreciation for that diversity, and we need to be willing to call a spade a spade when it comes to a hate group, sometimes a violent group like the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay, I've learned a lot, and I hope you have as well. Uh, pan for our panelists. <laughs>